Hello, um, glad you could uh, join us uh, for our uh, joint event with R Street Institute and Common Good. And uh, we're, you know, I I've been covering police accountability issues in California for many years. And one thing I've noticed, and one of the things that prompted this event, uh, there's there's been a real change in uh, in uh, focus on uh, on police accountability issues. So. Um, we're going to talk broadly and more nationally, but my, my focus has been on California and we've been a pretty much a tough on crime state, which often surprises people. Um, I still recall uh, the 1998 gubernatorial debate between Democrat Gray Davis and uh, Republican Attorney General Dan Lundgren, and they were arguing over who would be more uh, you know, tough on crime. Singapore is a good starting point in terms of law and order, uh, Davis said. Uh, he was referring to the country that executed, <laughs> executed drug dealers. And he also insisted that he'd be willing to execute 14 year olds. So that's kind of when I got to California, that was was kind of the, the, the background on law and order issues. And, and basically Democrats such as Davis weren't gonna allow Republicans to outflank them on the right on law and order and policing issues. I had covered the uh, 2006 Copley decision a state Supreme Court decision that shut down public access to police disciplinary hearings. And there was um, no appetite in the legislature to do anything about that following that. So, you know, as I saw in my, in my reporting coverage, I, I worked, I was on the editorial board of the Orange County Registers um, and uh, also wrote for the, later on in the San Diego Union Tribune. Uh, Republicans love law and order and Democrats love police unions. And we didn't get any sort of change. It was quite frustrating. But in recent years, we've seen a dramatic shift. Uh, a couple of years ago, SB 1421 opened records and finally undid some of the aspects of Copley. And this year, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom uh, signed a package of police reform bills, including one that would uh, decertify um, police officers. And uh, that, that was, we were one of four states that, that did not have that. Um, so and, and anyway, all the four states were, were democratic states, which is interesting. But anyway, we're, that, that's just the backdrop of, of the shift that we've been seeing, I've been seeing, and we're gonna you know, take a look at that shift from a uh, national perspective. So we have two, two um, experts in these types of issues. Uh, Philip Howard is uh, chairman of the board of Common Good, nonpartisan national coalition dedicated to restoring common sense to America talk about tough jobs. Uh, he's also senior counsel at the law firm Covington and Burling. Uh, his latest book is Try Common Sense, Replacing the Failed Ideologies of Right and Left. And he, uh, he lives in Manhattan. Uh, Jillian Snyder is the policy director for the R Street Institute's Criminal Justice and Civil Liberties team. Uh, she's a retired New York City police officer. And I hope uh, she finds a way to share some of her stories from her uh, vice assignments. Uh, she also teaches as an adjunct lecturer at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and she lives uh, in, in New York, uh, north of New York City. So what I thought we'd do is uh, we're going we're gonna to keep this to an hour, and uh, those uh, people here who are, who are watching and want to send me questions to, uh, can do so uh, to add into the mix here. So um, we'll start with some opening thoughts. Uh, basically, uh, for, for both of the panelists, do you agree that the tide has shifted, uh, that, that what I described is accurate from what you're seeing in New York and across the country? So let's start with Philip. Uh, well, I think, <clears throat> I think uh, to slightly change the metaphor, the waters are roiling, but I wouldn't say that the tide has shifted. I think the narrative is entirely in the wrong direction between um, either defund the police or doing a few marginal reforms, but not really changing, you know, what I think is really important, which is their relationship to the community and, um, and, and really their important, the trust, the public, both the trust of them with the public and the public's trust of police. So I think much bigger changes are needed than are being, um, than are being discussed. And um, at least we're having the discussion about the police and accountability. And I think that's a, obviously an important change. Okay, uh, Jill, uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? And well, if we're looking at 
um, support and opposition for the union specifically, I think the tide has changed in that regard. Um, Republicans have always historically been opposed, um, not supportive of unions, labor unions. And they're very, um, they work closely actually with police unions, often for candidacy and um, you know endorsement for political office. And on the other side, we always had more support um, police officers from Democrats and they more or less, you know, we're accepting of the unions. And we've seen, especially since last year, um, it, it's definitely changed. Okay. And, and um, from your perspective as a former police officer, is, is it changed for the, the better? Or do we think that, uh, uh, has, has, uh, is this long in coming? I'm sure not everything that's changed is for the better, but do but you think the overall shift is, is in, in a good direction? No, I think that we've stymied reform efforts. Um, like 20 years ago, there was more collaboration between police and people in general, um, especially after 9-11. It felt like there was more unison. Um, cops were more receptive to the community. Community was more appreciative and accepting of what cops were doing on the street. They valued public safety, and that was at the forefront of what everyone was talking about. They wanted the feeling of security. And in the last five years, We've seen, you know, a lot of police involved incidents that, you know, have caused media attention and people questioning tactics and training and um, overall, even the um, disciplinary methods that police agencies use. And then in the last two years, we've seen just utter divisiveness. Like we are so far apart. We know what our end goal is from both the policing aspect and from the community. Um, everyone kind of knows what we need but we, we're not getting there because we can't come to terms with what should be done in collaboration with one another. Yeah, I, you know, as a working on a newspaper editorial board and I did a lot of uh, local coverage in, uh, you know, in Orange County mostly and Southern California. And I saw that, um, you know, there were quite a few incidents, uh, you know, that, that I cover, it was always one after another, a police shooting. And there was often just this, this, uh, this insistence by the police agencies to pretty much cover up what happened and to always defend the police officer. And, and I, to what degree, I mean, I think that's, that's what helps build some of the frustration, you know, like I was um, reading the uh, Obama administration's report um, following the Ferguson uh, 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 unrest, uh, I guess the Michael Brown shooting. And they talked about how, I thought it was a fascinating report because it talked about how the um, the police department in that city treated the average citizen, and they basically used used them as a uh, as a cash cow, and it was kind of a, almost an abuse of a very aggressive uh, relationship. And my sense has been that that's some of some of what we're seeing uh, has been just this pent up frustration at those type of policing efforts and and based on my coverage I, I think that's true I'm maybe I go to Philip do you do you, um do you think I'm right there do you do you have a sense well, of it? I, I, yeah I do I mean I think that there's a um um I mean to and also to support what what, what Jillian's saying uh there's sort of a bunker mentality that's that's developed and it's exacerbated by by all this combat gear that the federal government's been throwing at police forces so they they show up on the streets, you know, looking like, uh, you know, sort of action figures from some kind of futuristic movie or something. I mean, instead of being members of the community. So, you know, there is this, um, we, I think we're in a bad place. Um, and, and as Jillian said, you can close your eyes and, and, and imagine a different way of doing things. You can imagine um, a police precinct with has really active relations with all the community leaders that where where police walking on the street or on a first name basis with many of the with many of the people in the neighborhood uh, you know where where there's a um, esprit de corps because everyone knows that they have an important vital job and they um, and and you don't tolerate abuse by anyone, including your own. You know, just as you're 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 there to prevent crime or, pre or prevent people from misbehaving, you also need to do it for yourself. 
you, you can't, you know, you, and so, it's, 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 and, and, and you can't have a good internal culture if you tolerate people who, who abuse citizens. You know, all of us, that it's like acid inside the precinct house, you know, and, and, and good cops talk about that. So, so it's not hard to imagine how this would work, but it involves pushing a reset button uh, and having a new deal with cops, having a more informal mechanism for making sure that accountability is fair, not having all these, you know, <laughs> these endless grievance procedures that make it impossible to hold a cop accountable, where things are more manageable, where there's much more communication and community, but we're not there. You know, we're I think we're just at the beginning of a place where we realize that there's a problem. And it's not just a problem for the public, it's a problem for the police. Yeah, and Sheila, what, what do you think about, you know, what I had said about, uh, you know, my experiences covering some of these local agencies? I mean, I, I have all sorts of stories. I mean, I remember, I just remember one in particular where the police had um, uh, ended up uh, killing a guy and uh, they had claimed that he was in the fight of their life and then, they forgot that there was a, uh, a video camera nearby and we saw that it, it wasn't anywhere near how, how they described it. So there's a sense among a lot of people in the public that even when police behave in reprehensible ways that they're not going to get punished. Uh, did, do you, did you see any of that in the police department and what, what's, your, uh, what's your cure for it? Well, I'm going to be completely honest with you. As much as I loathe when a cop does something against people's civil rights or excessive force or anything to that nature, we know that does not happen all the time. The media is like pushing it on us that cops are running around and it's like the wild, wild west. And it's the last study was like 1.2% of police involved interactions end in the use or even the threat of use of force. So it's not a common occurrence. When it does happen, though, it does have to be investigated as any other crime. Um, we should not automatically assume that a cop was in the wrong. Um, I think that cops should be afforded the same rights as everyone else in that a proper investigation should be conducted. I actually would prefer if outside agencies were conducting those force investigations because I think that you know, we need someone impartial to really evaluate if the cop did everything the right way, if they followed the law, if they followed departmental policy. Um, but I don't think that we should automatically assume that the cop did something wrong or did something illegal. Allow, you know, me, that's why I'm a big fan of body cameras. I was elated when body cameras came out because I think it protects the cops as much as it protects the citizens. Yeah. When you're doing your job the right way, the body camera is going to show that. So if someone does make an allegation against you, go to the footage, you know, that's what I used to say. And I think it's great. And I understand initially why cops were hesitant. They didn't understand, like this was a new thing. Um, probably about eight, nine years ago, they started putting up cameras all over New York City. So we kind of already knew we were on camera. They installed cameras in the precincts, in the cells, in the hallways. We knew we were being surveilled because they wanted to make sure cops were doing their job the right way. Then they put body cameras on our chests. And I really think that it was just so dramatic when it happened. Um, cops were, you know, like, I don't want this. But overall, the cops that I worked with and cops that I talked to just in doing research, they're like, I think this is a good idea because now I'm protected. But as you said, I was fortunate. I worked in Brooklyn and the Bronx. I worked with some great officers over the course of my career. Um, and I never was involved in a cover-up or did I witness like a scandal or cover-up, thank goodness. Um, but at the same time, most cops, they sign up for this job because they want to do this job the right way. They want to protect their community. I grew up in New York City and that's what I wanted to do. Um, so there's a few bad apples and we've heard that line before, but it's, it's the truth. Yeah, I mean, my sense, I, I don't think any of us in the serious reform oriented movement think that most police interactions go down that way or that most police behave that way. But the problem is on some of the ones I've covered is when it does happen that way, that uh, even when it's caught on camera, that it, 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 it doesn't uh, often lead to punishment. And then of course, you know, with the Peace Officers Bill of Rights and the various additional protections that police officers get in 
local collective bargaining agreements that it's not just that they have everyone has a right to due process, but that, that they're getting they're getting uh, quite a bit more protections than any average person. And I, I my sense is that maybe that leads to a lot of the the frustration we've seen. But but what I want to get at next is is you know what's the what's the cause of it? And um, you know I, I think the the I'll go to Philip here on the on the unions. I mean. Um, in my view, I, I often use the, uh, the, the, when I talk in my columns, I write mostly for a conservative audience and uh, conservatives tend to be, uh, you know, very supportive of police officers. So I use the comparison to teachers and, uh, you know, it's impossible, virtually impossible, the dance of the lemons and the, the uh, turkey trot, as they call it, to, to get rid of bad teachers. You, you, they trot them off to different departments and we've seen that on policing. And I think it's very similar. The unions uh, make it hard to, to get rid of bad police officers. And it's, they make it hard to reward particularly good ones. So, uh, Philip, what do, you, what do you think we do in terms of the, the union issue? Well, uh, uh, it's foundational. I mean, ultimately, cops, cops have a really important, tough job. And they need to be able to be free to use their judgment in the circumstances. And uh, I agree that they need to be protected from unfair allegations and all that. Um, uh, but, but you can't have a good culture if everybody knows that no one is accountable. You know, in, in Minneapolis, the, the policeman who killed George Floyd had I don't know, 18 complaints uh, over the years. Uh, the city of Minneapolis had had 2,600 complaints in the prior decade, of which 12 resulted in discipline, of which the longest discipline was a 48 hour suspension. The uh, police union contract, which, is, which I just read this morning, is 128 pages long. It, uh, it mandates that all suspensions shall be measured in hours. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, you know, not, they, I mean, it's really, it, and, and the levels of appeal for anything, including putting a negative comment in the file, basically make it impossible to manage the force. So, so it, it, when you put up um, uh, an iron wall against accountability, which is basically what happens. Then, and you have all these stories that are, as Jillian said, by a tiny percentage of the cops, you know, 1%, less than 1%. But nonetheless, they're the ones that hit the newspapers where, where cops act abusively. Then it just corrodes everything. It corrodes public trust. It corrodes the culture within the thing. And the unions will never, ever fix it because this is their power. So, so we can talk about that, but it's the same with the teachers union. Ultimately, I think they both suffer a constitutional problem because we supposedly elect people to run the schools and to run the police department to be accountable for how they do. And these contracts make it so that they can't run the police department. And so, um, I think that we are coming as a society towards a reckoning, and it's a reckoning which I think, you know, would put somebody like Jillian in charge of remaking what, what probably most cops know is needed in terms of how they're, how they're managed, how they're compensated, how they're treated fairly. All those things need to be reasonable, but it's not, it doesn't bear much resemblance to what's there now. Which is a bunch. Right. Federal, federal data shows that a tiny percentage of police cause the overwhelming majority of a police chief's problems and often cause uh, multiple uh, civil settlements. So I, I've seen that in some cases I've looked at. You, you look into the officer and he's been involved in, in multiple uh, uh, civil cases. And I think that's where the union, the unions keep those people on the, on the force. And so, Jill, uh, if you could maybe touch on on the union aspect and what, do, do you have any practical advice based on, uh, I assume you were in a police union 
And uh, if you have any ideas of, of, of what can be done to, if, if anything could be done to reform the unions. See, but here's the one thing, and I know Philip just pointed out Minneapolis as an example. Unions all over the country, they're so different in how much involvement they have. I can only really speak to the NYPD because that's where I worked and I was a member of the PBA for my entire career. And I could tell you that the anytime an officer gets in trouble, we have a very elaborate disciplinary process within the NYPD. Um, you have, you could range from being warned and admonished in a little command log to losing five vacation days, 10 vacation days, 30 days suspension, um, amongst other things. We, the common suspension, if you're in serious trouble, is 30 days, um, which is a lot to go without pay a whole month. And that's pretty much what they do if you do something that is elevated to the point of major disciplinary infraction. So we don't have consistency across the board with unions, how much uh, leverage they have over the department. Um, yes, the PBA historically has always supported cops when they have gotten into trouble. But once that cop is shown to have done something or demonstrated a clear disregard for human life or a breach in significant breach in departmental policy or a direct violation of the law, the PBA pretty much drops their support and they won't even pay for your legal fees. So everyone knows if you're a union member, you pay union dues. That's to protect you. That's to fund, you know, what's going on within the union for our collective bargaining or binding arbitration or trying to get better working conditions. But it also will pay for an officer who's facing a civil litigation if necessary. But if it's shown that you were in the wrong, the union doesn't support you anymore, at least here in New York City. So we need to come up with a way to get, you know, unions to have, unions should not be able to meddle in the disciplinary process. That should really be for the department itself to maintain and manage. NYPD has been doing a really good job. They've put together a structured disciplinary. It's like, the, if you do this, this is the penalty. If you do that, this is the penalty to try and take away the subjective nature of how they've imposed disciplinary punishment in the past. But not all unions operate that way. Some unions are larger than others. Um, and again, some departments do allow their unions to get involved where they really shouldn't be involved. Okay. I want to shift uh, maybe. Oh, go ahead, yeah, Philip. Yeah, 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 let me just say, I mean, there, were, th there have been a number of um, survey studies of police union contracts and police union accountability. accountability. You know, Stephen, Stephen Ruchin, Professor Stephen Ruchin has done some of them and looked at literally hundreds of police union contracts. And the vast preponderance of them are designed not to do what you said, Joanne, not to sort of abandon the cop who, who does the wrong thing, but to actually prevent any meaningful accountability. I mean, we're talking about people who were convicted of crimes, who were required to go back on the force. You know, I mean, it's like literally, it was madness. It's like in schools, there was this one New York City situation where the teacher was uh, selling cocaine, <laughs> you know, selling cocaine to other teachers. He goes to jail and he's required under the contract to come back and, you know, to the schools. I mean, literally, I mean, it's, I mean you know, what do you need? So, so, so maybe maybe the PBA in New York is more more realistic than than the hundreds of other uh, contracts that that Professor Rushin has looked at, but but th these contracts are designed to prevent police forces from getting rid of the bad apples, or indeed even even you know having minor punishments, but. You know, in every job, there are people who work out and don't work out. <laughs> it's true in boring jobs, and I'm sure it's true in really tough jobs like being a policeman. And so you need to be able to make the judgments about who's really good on the street. I mean, Derek Chauvin, the guy who killed George Floyd, was thought to be, quote, tightly wound. Well, that's not really a good, you know, he had a hair trigger, trigger tip temper. It's not really a good trait for somebody who's got a loaded pistol you know, <laughs> on the beat. So, so whoever's running the police force needs to be able to say, you know, you're not really, you know, you should be doing something else with your life. Um, and we can't do that. And that's bad for the cops. And it's really, 
really bad for the public. Well, the, yeah, I, in Derek Chauvin's case, that was a complete oversight by the department. If it's documented that this guy is tightly wound, I personally would not want to work with another officer who's tightly wound. They may be more argumentative, more subject to start fights with people unnecessarily. And that's just going to you know, risk my safety, risk the community's safety. Yeah. But in that case, not to say that I'm I'll never excuse the union if they're fighting on behalf of a really bad cop. I don't think that's what they're there to do. When they were started a hundred and change years ago, their whole purpose was to get cops. The Boston cops hadn't gotten wage increases in years. That was why the union started mm -hmm. and they were fighting for, you know, better accommodations. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, we have had such horrible, deplorable precinct conditions we didn't even get toilet paper in my precinct. We didn't have toilet paper in our bathrooms, in our locker rooms, which by the way, were cockroach infested closets that we had to change in. And, you know, we had to go to the union and be like, we don't even get toilet paper at work. Like we have to give, when we have a prisoner in the cell, they have toilet paper, we don't. The ladies room has nothing, no soap, no, no, no operable toilet bowl. And, you know, we had to go to the union because we, we thought we deserved a little bit better of a working condition. You could spend 30 hours at work if you're on an arrest. And they did that for us. They fought for us. They got us beds in our locker room in case you had to sleep the night, you know, sleep over. But on the whole, I mean, they shouldn't be meddling when there's a bad cop. We should be, as collectively, cops don't support other bad cops. So I think in that regard... The union should stick to what they are, are supposed to be doing, just ensuring that cops have safe working conditions, that they have equitable wages, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Well, what I, I mean, what I've seen in California is I, well, I have not seen evidence of police unions um, turning on bad cops. I mean, they, they fund the legal defense. There's the, it's an insurance program, but they fund the legal defense for police officers, you know, accused of all sorts of things. And, and after SB 1421 passed, where we finally got access to the disciplinary records, and we saw that there were hundreds of cops who were convicted of crimes, and what had traditionally happened was they'd be allowed to plead down to misdemeanors so that they could continue on the force. And I saw all of these things. I, I personally tie it to, to unions, and I, I see this, uh, you know, protect it at all costs our fellow members. I mean, that's on, on some of the, the cases I've covered. That's what I've seen. Um, you know, even, but anyway, it's it's uh, interesting to your perspective on it. Uh, but but I wanted to um, maybe get into uh, 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 let's let's talk about culture a little bit. Uh, you know, there the, the I, I believe there's a union problem. Uh, there are a number of policy problems. But is there a cultural problem? In, in a lot of the police officers that I've interviewed, there's, there seems to be a hostility uh, towards efforts to, to change or reform, which is natural, I think, in government. We see it in, in any aspect of government. Uh, the, the willingness to change isn't great. And, uh, and there's this kind of paramilitary circle the wagons culture that I've seen in some of the cases I've covered. Philip, do you, do you, what do you think about how, how do we change the police culture towards one that's a little more, uh, a little less militaristic and a little more open to reform? Well, I think Jillian knows a lot more about this than probably anybody else on this, yeah, on this conversation. But, um, you know, there's so much distrust right now with defund the police and, you know, get those bad cops, you know, so is uh, that that the circle the wagons mentality is only exacerbated. It's not it's not made better. It's made worse. So somehow or another, we need to lead. We need to have a kind of detente, you know, and lead people out of the wagons, and and come up with a um, system that that honors cops. You know, that I mean, pays people well and does have Good working conditions, a toilet paper, <laughs> you know, and all the things that, that that you know a basic person could expect. But um, and and if you look at the way uh, a good company works, in part because they're trying to avoid private unionization, they actually have workers' councils who, for example, give their opinion about whether somebody should continue to keep their job. 
you know, management at Toyota will say, well, this person doesn't seem to be working out very well. And they'll ask a workers council to go, you know, the people who work with the person, what do you think? There's not necessarily binding, but there's a, there's a, there are ways to be fair to people um, that don't involve these kind of impregnable shields, legal shields that uh, everyone has. So, and I think all the, not all, but a lot of the reform efforts that are happening, like, um, like get rid of qualified immunity, for example, you know, we talked about that, you know, which is, can you sue a cop? You know, can a private person sue a cop? Well, I've studied how lawsuits happen. I've written books about it. And if you make it easy to sue somebody in any contentious situation, guess what? <laughs> they're, they're, you're gonna have a lot of lawsuits. Um, I mean, just look at, you know, people have an accident in the playground, there's a lawsuit. Uh, people uh, don't get a promotion, there's a lawsuit. Uh, so uh, I think there are lots of bad reform ideas when what's really needed is something far simpler and far more related to the needs and the dignity of the humans involved. And, you know, and, and, and instead we have going to your culture point, you know, we have a situation where, where I mean, Jillian comment, do you think there's a bunker mentality? I, that's my impression, but, but please first. Cops don't want to change because it's been ingrained in them that what you've been doing for however many years is it's it's working, obviously. Um, that's how we're trained. And why I don't know why I can't tell you the occupational culture of policing is so different from other jobs. Um, we're the only job in which you can use coercive force to gain compliance. Mm. We are literally the only occupation in which we have that right. And you know, that makes us unique from other anything from any other job in this yeah. world but the problem with and i'm pro reform but it's all about how it's introduced and why it's introduced so in the last year and a half they've been just slamming all these reforms down the cop's throat and the unions of course are in opposition because all of these these reforms are reactive something bad happened so mm -hmm. we're going to now shove all this onto every single cop every single agency across the board but no one, like Steve said, no, we're never actually giving cops or departments accolade when they do things the right way, when they have a really low use of force record, um, when, you know, right. their public safety in their area is maintained and they didn't see a dramatic increase right. in violent crime. And, but I'm sorry. And they're given the wrong jobs. They've got to be mental health workers, you know, and, you know, and all these, they've given all these assignments that they're not trained for and shouldn't have to have. And I've said that for a really long time. When I was on patrol, I would go to a drug overdose. And then I would go to an individual suffering from a mental health crisis. Then I would go to a husband and wife just having an argument because one spent more money than they were supposed to. And I'm like, okay, so today I was an EMT. Then I was a social worker. Then I was a marriage counselor, you know, and I didn't go to school for that. I went to school for right. criminology. Um, right. But, you know, we're putting all these, we're making them just de facto social service. That's what you are. Right. And right. back in the day, believe it or not, the NYPD, that was their job when they started. They were the garbage men, the firemen. They put on the little lanterns on all the street corners, as well as maintain public safety. And they weren't even armed back then. We've kind of gone back in time and we've done that to cops today. We are giving them too many responsibilities, which A, they're not educated to do, they're not trained properly, and they're not equipped. And if you think about a cop, I want a cop out there stopping the violent crime. I want them protecting and preserving human life. I don't want them, and not that I don't think that's important to have the proper people on scene. If there's someone suffering from a mental health crisis and they're violent or they're in possession of a weapon, we can't send EMTs or paramedics there who are not trained in tactics or fighting or anything else. We have to send them with protection, but we don't train. We're just starting in the last few years, de-escalation methods, how to deal with someone in an emotional crisis. But for my whole career, we were just like, go and figure it out when you get there. And if you have to call emergency services to come and help you restrain this individual, that's what we did, because that's the only thing cops know how to do. 
Our job is to really go out there and arrest the bad guy, maintain mm-hmm. public safety. So dealing with all of these other things that are outside the purview of cops, it's not helping the situation at all. And then we're blaming them when they mess up. That's really good insight. I mean, I'm seeing one of the reforms that I personally like the best is these efforts. Uh, I guess it started in Eugene uh, to send um, you know uh, uh, social worker type people to social work type situations. And um, I, I just saw a homeless task force police car uh, in the suburb near where I live. And I thought, wow, this is, this is, I think that's a positive reform. Um, And I thought maybe you can address some of the reforms that you think would be good ones, Jill, um, you know, moving forward. Well, I really love the crisis response model that's, you know, going up around the country in certain jurisdictions. We have pilot programs here in the city. California has been doing it. South Carolina has been doing it. Um, A lot of cops do have training other than what, you know, they're being a cop. They go to school for other things. So in an agency in South Carolina, they have some cops who did get an MSW. They do have a background in social work. They're also police officers. Those are the cops that are probably better equipped to go out and deal with a person suffering from a mental health crisis. Now, I have always been opposed to sending armed in full uniform cops to someone who's suffering a mental health crisis, because what are they thinking when they see this person get out of a marked police car, lights and sirens with their vest and their gun and their baton and their mace and their taser and all these things on their tool belt, that does not help the situation. Generally, (laughs) it escalates the situation. So um, the crisis response model, they are still using um, plainclothes officers who don't have all of these scary tools on their belt to, you know, maybe incite someone to get upset. Um, but they're sending people there that are trained to deal with it. The um, automatic go-to would be to go to a hospital, not to go to jail, because just because you're suffering from a mental health crisis doesn't mean you committed a crime. So really putting um, more effort into diverting things that are not police calls. Don't have cops go to things that aren't cops' jobs. And Crisis Response is an amazing program. Also, we used to have homeless outreach units throughout the NYPD. And the goal was to help those that are homeless not be on the street sleeping. And but we it was really hard for us because we ran out of alternatives. And it was either take them to a homeless shelter. And if they didn't want to do that, Uh, We could offer them to go to the hospital. And if they didn't want to do that, we were actually told at some point, then you have to arrest them for disorderly conduct or, you know, doing something on the street, like just loitering or whatever. But the problem was we didn't have the capacity. We didn't have the room to be, you know, knowing what to do with all the homeless people that we were encountering. They did subsequently um, get rid of that unit and try and revitalize it into a new way, which I think was smart because cops, we shouldn't criminalize being homeless on the street. Um, We need to obviously have more social service programs in place that help cops. Okay, I've encountered a homeless individual. And most homeless individuals usually are also suffering from an underlying mental condition. So we need to have someone to take this person to that's better equipped to do that than the cop. And that's really what we have to understand on a national scale. If we just divert cops to cop related incidents and crime breaking, you know, that's going to free up a lot of cops times to focus on violent offenders, to focus on maintaining public safety, but just we have to ensure that other things that are not crime related are addressed by the social service workers that are better equipped to handle it. Yeah, no, I want to change uh, course a little bit. Um, Before, you know, the the national uh, protests and uh, you know, over over George Floyd and and some of the other uh, incidents that we've seen, I had sensed um, that there was a, a growing bipartisan consensus towards certain sets of right. criminal justice reform. So, right. so the groups. Um, uh, it, well, I, I remember, for instance, in California, uh, Mark Leno, a very liberal uh, former senator from uh, San Francisco had brought in from Texas, Chuck DeVore, who was an extremely conservative Republican, former assemblyman from Orange County, who who works at um, the Texas Public Policy Foundation, which they do the right on crime. And anyway, they had kind of a love fest there. It it was great where they were in agreement on a lot of the reforms. And I had had felt that there was this actually this growing movement. And then the whole uh, 
you know, over the years of the Trump administration, and I think we've seen a, a more divided uh, culture war aspect to to everything. And I'm finding that a lot of the people on the right who I used to think were potential allies for some of these reforms are now in a just a law and order. We can't consider any sort of reform. And a, a lot on the left have gone in a, in a little bit of a zany direction with the defund the police. So how do we, we'll start with Philip, how, how do we rebuild, can we rebuild, how do we rebuild a, a bipartisan uh, movement for sensible reforms? We don't have to agree on what those reforms are exactly, there'll be differences, but how do we get, get some of that momentum back? Well, you know, there was that momentum. You had the conservative Koch family supporting criminal justice reforms, uh, John Arnold in Houston supporting criminal justice reforms that involves decriminalization. Uh, there's a proposed bill, I think, in Congress to do a, a survey of all the criminal statutes in the federal government, you know, which is a great idea. I mean, this stuff just piles up like sediment in the harbor. You know, nobody ever goes back and, and does a spring cleaning. So, so we're clearly in need of that. We clearly need um, just to help the police get a little bit out of the bunker. We clearly need a narrative that's about the importance of the police and making sure, as Jillian said, that, that their jobs can focus on what's important. They, they, they're not required to be social social service workers. Um, but uh, you, you know what I've spent my days doing now, I've been talking with Andrew Yang about this and talking to a bunch of former leaders like Ms. Daniels or former Senator Bob Corker and others, is um, trying to figure out how we fill a broader vacuum in the center. You know, there are groups like R Street and the Miss Cannon Center that have really smart people that have really good ideas about how to fix things. But with this political narrative, in part because of George Floyd and lots of other, and Donald Trump and lots of other things, it's like everyone's gone to there. You know, they're completely far away from each other. And so there's no space in the middle to actually talk about fixing things. And I think that the, the, um, the mistake that reformers make is that they think that somehow you can make a little change here and a little change there and things will improve. I don't agree with that at all. That's not the history of political science. It's a, the change happens in big gulps. The, they call it punctuated equilibrium. Things go along a certain way for a long time and then there falls off a cliff and there's a new way. And it could be good or bad, the new way. It could be, you know, it could be the French Revolution or the Soviet Union or whatever. But uh, but I think that most of the operating institutions of American society, police, schools, others, aren't functioning anywhere near where people want them to. And it's not because they're bad people. It's because the frameworks are no good. So I think we need to have an open, I think we need to come together in a, in a, in a demilitarized zone you know, and talk about, as we are today, uh, and, and start talking about, well, what should it look like? How should cops get paid? What is a fair way of doing accountability that doesn't shelter the bad cops? Um, you know, how do we define the cop's responsibility? How do we get rid of all these crimes that don't make any sense as crimes, you know, that are really social problems? And, uh, and we just haven't, because we've been so, and the media is so obsessed with the, you know, with the polarized factions, the defund the policers or whatever, that, that was, nobody's there. And so this, this discussion, I think is a, you know, a little step in that direction. But, but the thing that I would urge on people is that this is not a little reform problem. This is a push the reset button problem. You know, things have been going along a certain way for a long time and it's ended up in a blind alley. Yeah, well, Joe, Joe what your thoughts on um, on this? On, on Since you're kind of on the hot seat, since we're at our street, we're trying to promote 
uh, modest uh, reforms, right? Um, is there is there hope that what what do you think about that agenda and, and uh, the reset button that Philip talks about? Well, I'm glad Philip brought up the media because I don't think the media has been either the right or the left's friend over the last two years. I think they've they've fueled the divisiveness. They've pushed yeah, the yeah. right and the left further and further apart because as as he said, we used to all understand whether you're right or left. You knew that. The CJ system in and of itself needed to be changed. The whole system, not just policing. We know that there's a lot of other issues within the criminal justice system. We have pretrial concerns. We have concerns when people are incarcerated. How are we setting them up for success when they're released from incarceration? How can mm -hmm. they re-enter successfully mm -hmm. not to re-offend so they don't start back at the very beginning of that same process? And a few years ago, it seemed like there were conversations, the right would be receptive to the left and vice versa. And then last year happened and it just, it stopped. The conversations right. became just, there was no common ground, which is sad because everyone's common ground should be what's better for everyone. How can we improve a system that's historically not worked as well as it should? Um, and I think that we do need to hit that reset button because so I talk to Republican and Democrat policymakers all the time, and it's funny. In the you get it; it's inferred but never said. They all have the same goals. The outcomes that everyone's mm -hmm. hoping to achieve are the same, but the route in which we get there differs dramatically. You know, we each have our own. Um, I want to. I am a cop, so I always will support cops. But I know that policing needs to change. It can't be done like it used to be done. Um, police officers were, you know, back in the day, people really paid homage to cops because it was, it's a selfish job for the most part. And now it's, it's kind of spiraled out of control. We've allowed cops to do things that we know they shouldn't be doing. And everyone knows this. It's just who's going to step up and who's going to say, look, for everyone's safety, for, you know, the betterment of all mm -hmm. of us. How can we come together to fix this? So I definitely think hitting that reset button, coming to the drawing board, having the left, having the right, what do we want to achieve? How are we going to get there? But how are we going to do it together? Yeah, I, I started, um, you know, I started out mentioning, you know, that that uh, infamous uh, Davis uh, uh, Lundgren debate, which just uh, seemed to be the, the low point. I was going to say high point, but the low point of, but, but uh, anyway, um, so, but my point in bringing it back up is, is, uh, the sense of a growing crime rate and there was a growing crime rate in the eighties and nineties seemed to, to lead to that. And by 1998, uh, usually reform lags the actual crime rates. Um, so, so we were, we were heading into a debate where that was informed by years of rising crime, crime levels have subsequently fallen quite a bit and at some point to uh, 1960s era lows, but they seem to be ticking back up again um, in certain bigger cities, especially violent crime rates. So I haven't yet seen uh, that influence policy that much, but I'm wondering whether criminal justice reforms are going to be taken hostage to, you know, the, the growing fear about uh, public safety and street safety. Philip, your thoughts on that? You know, I don't know. I, I, I'm not smart enough to look in that crystal ball. Um, I mean, COVID separated people, created all kinds of, of alienation in addition to all the political stuff that we're talking about. And, and it strikes me as intuitively that it could lead to that kind of isolation could lead to more, to more violence. Um, I think we won't know that for you know, we won't know that for a couple of years, but what we do know is that public trust, particularly in certain big cities is, is lower than it ought to be, that we need um, both to reach out and to both to reach out to the public and have them feel more a stake in policing and also to reach out to the police so that they feel that they're honored and protected as well. And, and I, I don't, um, I, think think, I think two things need to happen. Um, I'm, I'm more familiar with the teachers union and the other civil service unions than I am the police unions. 
but those other unions will never allow any change. And so um, I believe the solution there is constitutional that, that you do have to create a system where you don't have micromanagement by 128 page union collective bargaining agreements. That's not the goal. The goal is to create an honorable, good, respected workforce that where everyone's treated fairly and, you know, and, and, and all the things that Jillian talks about, but that's a condition to getting to the goal. And, and so that's, I think, a separate problem. The, the problem that we're discussing today mainly is the need for leaders from the right and the left to get together and say, how do we make this system work better? And I think there should be a nonpartisan commission that's small that says, how do we improve relations between criminal justice broadly and the police force and society and come up with a new template that can then be the basis for a public discussion and debate and then can be the basis as we changed all these institutions 100 years ago or 120 years ago to change them again in the reset. Because I don't, in fact, think it's rocket science. I think you can get Julian and a couple of her friends together and they can come up with 90% of it, you know, in, in, in a couple of weeks. It's just not that hard. A lot of smart people, it's just that we're, we're also stuck in our trenches that, that we don't do it. So we need to have that discussion. I think a nonpartisan commission and a, and a detailed report is the way, like the Kerner Commission in the 60s or whatever, you know, is the way to, to, to make that proposal. And then maybe that could be an impetus for people coming out of their bunkers and starting to accept change. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and, and Jill, your thoughts on, um, do, are you seeing a change in public attitudes as at least there's a perception of rising crime? There is rising crime in some places and in some categories, not across the board, but um, are, how is that impacting uh, your work? Well, I mean, the FBI just launched, they just released the findings about a month and change ago. And I was very nervous uh, when they were going to make that formal statement because I knew just from what we read last year that we were definitely gonna see a rise in violent crime. I was happy though, that it was barely a 3% overall national increase in violent crime collectively. There was however, a 30% increase in homicides across the country. That's concerning. Um, property crime, which I would have thought usually in times of economic uncertainty, theft increases because we were all locked away in our houses for several months. You really couldn't go break into anyone's house because everyone was home together. So we didn't see a significant increase in property crime. Um, the high of property crime increase was really surrounding the protests um, just because we had so many stores burglarized and broken into and vandalisms, but that was isolated to protest related incidents. But since the, um, the release of the FBI, it, I have gotten a little pushback when talking to people who are more conservative um, when the narrative was, okay, we understand that it's important to be tough on crime, but we have to be tough on the right crime. We have to be tough on the real crime that's a threat to people's lives. Um, now it's kind of like, uh-oh, the numbers are spiking again. We don't want to go back to the 1980s and the early 1990s. So I think we're going to have to really... Um, our street, what we do is we want practical reform, right? So my team and I, we are for CJ reform. That we know it's needed, but we want it done the right way. And we still want to hold people accountable. We still want the really bad criminals who are killing people. We want them to go to prison, but we know that we need to, we over-criminalize as a country. We have way too many laws. Uh, people can go to jail for absolute nonsense, and it's a waste of resources. It's a waste of taxpayers' money. It's a waste of cops' times. And what we really need to do is, again, reset. We need to look at last year was an anomaly. We've never, at least those of us that are alive today, have never experienced something like COVID before. So it's going to need to be studied longitudinally, see, you know, what kind of role COVID played in the increase in crime. But I honestly, just me, I think that one of our biggest issues of last year, which contributed to the increase in homicides was 
The media has spewed the illegitimacy of police for the last 18 months. People are less likely to follow the law mm -hmm. if they believe it's illegitimate. And I think this is a real concern. So instead of fueling that narrative, defund the police, we don't need them anyway. We really need to give them the tools to do their job, but to do it collectively with the community to restore and rebuild that trust. Because I think when we have positive police community like relationships, I think overall that's when we'll see crime drop again. What, um, if so, change track a little bit and, and we're getting close towards the end. I, I'd really like to get both of your thoughts on this movement towards progressive DAs. And over the years, I've been frustrated that uh, as someone uh, who's worked in the media, Jill, and might, might, might dispute a little bit on your take on the media, but that, that could be another conference sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, but the DAs typically have been elected with, by police unions and with the support of police, and they often just seem to be a, uh, another arm of the, of, of, of the police, uh, you know. And, but on the other hand, some of the progressive DAs seem to be uh, not viewing their job correctly, right? Maybe uh, not seeing their job as, as prosecuting people who've committed crimes, but, uh, you know, uh, committing to broad social change. I, I think there are different uh, perspectives among the progressive DAs, some that I, I, I admire and some that I don't. But, uh, Philip, do you have a general sense on, on that movement as a reform movement? Is that overall positive, negative, or, or, or what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, no, I really don't. I think, uh, I think prosecu the prosecutors like the police, um, it depends on how you do your job. You know, I mean, there, 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 there are people who use their judgment to go after people who are real criminals and, um, and protect society. And there are some who are out to make, to get headlines. And they'll, and they'll you know, as, as Jillian said, you can, or as some former judge says, you can indict a ham sandwich. <laughs> so, you know, there, you know, there's so many, so many laws against everything. So really, you know, you're, you're very much dependent on the, on the good faith of the, you know, of the prosecutors. And when they put in sentencing guidelines, they could be gamed so that you could extort people into giving plea bargains rather than face a life sentence for some, you know, not very great crime. So, so there are all kinds of abuses that can come out of a DA's office. And the most important thing, it seems to me, is not their politics, but their good faith. You know, uh, quick thoughts on that, and then we'll get to some closing remarks. I see we're, we're running up against the deadline. Um, so, I mean, progressive DA, it's a really broad term. Um, there's some DAs who I, I actually applaud their wanting to reform the system and not, you know, pursue charges against people that commit really low-level, non-harmful offenses. I get that. But what's going to happen ultimately if we have more progressive DAs, that's, they're not in line with cops at all. So cops have to uphold the law of the state, right? If we don't like the law and if the DA doesn't want to pursue charges, then repeal that law because we're going to have a conflict where cops are locking up people who break a law, bringing it to a progressive ADA who is then dismissing the charges. That's problematic for cops because if the DA choose, the cop did his job or her job and you know had probable cause to make an arrest, the ADA decided to decline charges because they didn't want to pursue charges, not because it wasn't in direct violation of the law, but because their office is decriminalizing things on their own, but they're still illegal, right? So that cop is now subject to a lawsuit because the DA's office failed to press charges. That's going to cause an issue. Yeah. If the cops are locking people up with probable cause that are laws on the books, the ADA should be following suit. So we need to have some collaboration between cops and progressive DAs, or we're going to have a real problem. Yeah, good, good thoughts. Uh, okay, we've got uh, 30 seconds each for uh, Philip. Any, any final points you want to make to uh, our listeners here? Well, I think we have a crisis of trust in the criminal justice system. And, um, and the distrust comes from many sources, including overcriminalization, including vilifying entire police forces when there are only a few bad apples, including the lack of accountability. And all those things need to get fixed to restore trust. And so I think we need to um, um, comprehend how much, I don't think it's complicated, how much the system needs to get changed to restore that trust. 
Great. And Jill, your final uh, final 30 second remarks here. So I just think that we need to, the police and the community, we just need to come together and we have to figure out what's most important to us. How do we achieve those goals? How do we do it together? The cops have to be more receptive to the community's concerns and the community needs to understand that the cops are out there trying to do their job to the best of their ability. All right. Well, thanks guys. Thanks for tuning in um, on behalf of R Street and Common Good. Um, and have a have a good week. Thanks so much. Thanks, David. Thank